Professor Indiana Jones made archaeology a cool, non-stop barrel of action on screen, in real-life archaeological discoveries are seldom dramatic. They're still quite important, as they expand and shed new light on our knowledge of the past, and allow us to separate historic facts from myths and legends. Following our 20 things about some of history's more fascinating archaeological facts. Plato's Atlantis wasn't that nice. The legend of Atlantis began circa 360 BC when Plato wrote about a utopian, advanced, and dramatically lost country that vanished beneath the waves. In his Timaeus and Critias dialogues, in popular culture nowadays Atlantis is presented as a peaceful and wise country, an idealized model of what humanity could be. That was not Plato's Atlantis though. He wrote about a rich, technologically advanced, and militarily powerful country that was corrupted by its power. It tried to conquer the world and the good guys in Plato's narrative were not the good people of Atlantis, but Athens and her allies, who fought back. If Plato's Atlantis existed today, it would probably try to conquer and enslave us all. That Atlantis, eventually sunk by the gods as punishment for its people's hubris and moral decline, was entirely fictional, a plot device to advance some philosophical points. Centuries later, many people began to believe that Atlantis was real and tried to prove its existence. The legend's revival in the modern era and its transformation into popular pseudoscience can be traced back to a 19th century amateur historian and congressman, Ignatius Donnelly. He wrote an 1882 book, The Antediluvian World, in which he added new facts that became part of the Atlantis myth. He also theorized that all major human advances can be traced back to Plato's sunken island. Is there any archaeological evidence, though, that Atlantis ever existed? Archaeological evidence or lack thereof of Atlantis' existence. Serious scholars were dismissive of Ignatius Donnelly, but some writers took his version of Atlantis and ran with it. Most prominent among them in the early 20th century were a mystic named Madame Blavatsky, and a famous psychic named Edgar Cayce. Cayce imparted a Christian spin to the story, and gave psychic readings in which he claimed that many of his clients had led past lives in Plato's island. He also predicted that Atlantis would be discovered in 1969. It was not despite Plato's specificity about Atlantis' location. The philosopher wrote of an island bigger than Asia, what Greeks called Asia Minor back then, and Libya put together, situated in the Atlantic Ocean at the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea, just past the Straits of Gibraltar. Advocates of a real Atlantis argue that he was mistaken, or that for his own reasons, he deliberately sought to mislead. Despite great advances in submarine, deep-sea probe, oceanography, and ocean floor mapping technologies, no evidence, archaeological or otherwise has emerged that Plato's fable described a real place, although the ocean deep is still full of mysteries, it is diverged landmass bigger than Asia Minor and Libya. Nonetheless, the notion of a lost advanced civilization is so fascinating, and so readily titillates people's imaginations, that it is highly unlikely that the legend of Atlantis will die off anytime soon. The Accidental Discovery of Machu Picchu In 1875, Hiram Bingham was born to American missionary parents in Hawaii as a child. He wanted to follow in his parents' footsteps, but he as grew up, he realized that he was not cut out for the life of a missionary. He liked football and outdoors activities far more than reading the Bible. Eventually, he went to Yale then studied for a PhD in Harvard. Bingham hit the jackpot when he met, wooed, and married, the heiress to the Tiffany jewelry fortune, a marriage that dismayed her parents. His wife's money afforded him the opportunity to indulge his passion for travel and exploration, and he took full advantage of that. Bingham was fascinated by the history of the Inca Empire and in 1911, he led an archaeological expedition in Peru. He sought to find the lost city of Vilcabamba, the last refuge of Inca Mancho Capac, who resisted the Spaniards into the 1530s. As he explored some ruins near Cusco, he ran into a local farmer, who told him there were more ruins up a nearby mountain. Bingham and his team walked and rode mules to the mountaintop, where they discovered Machu Picchu. It had remained largely untouched throughout Peru's Spanish colonial period. Today it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world. So popular in fact that a limit was placed on the number of visitors. Archaeological Find Sheds Light on the Domestication of Cats It was widely assumed until relatively recently, based on available evidence, that wild cats were domesticated into common household cats in ancient Egypt around 4,000 years ago, 
however new archaeological discoveries indicate that the first domestication of cats probably happened in China. Feline bones unearthed in the Chinese agricultural village of Quan Hu Kun, in Shanxi, reveal that cats lived there alongside humans about 5,300 years ago. As researchers discovered from the archaeological evidence, the farmer's grains attracted rodents, which led to an unwelcome pest infestation. Ceramic storage containers from the period, specially designed to keep rodents out of the farmer's grain stocks, indicate that the infestation was serious. The rodents, in turn, attracted wild cats to the village. Thus was born a three-way relationship that led to the domestication of wild cats. Farmers harvested and stored grain in their villages. The stored grain attracted rodents to the village. The rodents in turn attracted wild cats to the village. The farmers observed that the wild cats preyed upon the rodents, so they tolerated the felines' presence in their villages, and even encouraged them to stick around. Eventually with the passage of time and over many generations, the wild cats' descendants became domestic cats. As it turns out, humans did not domesticate cats. Cats domesticated themselves. We now know that wild cats lived alongside humans for thousands of years before they were domesticated. DNA analysis shows that in those millennia of coexistence before domestication, the wild cats' genes hardly changed. There were only a few minor and cosmetic alterations in their coats to produce the dots and stripes of the tabby cat. Also, unlike other domesticated animals, cat domestication did not come about because of deliberate human efforts. Instead, the process was initiated and driven by the cats themselves, attracted by the relative abundance of rodents in and around human agricultural communities. They deliberately sought out those communities and the delicious rodents therein. It was only after thousands of years in which wild cats lived alongside humans and preyed upon the rodents that infest our crops that they changed eventually. There was enough genetic variation between the wild cats that lived amongst us and those still out in the wild that we ended up with a common tabby. We did not deliberately bring that about but simply tolerated and welcomed those wild cats as they preyed on the rodents that stole our grains. So in that sense humans did not domesticate cats. Instead cats domesticated themselves. The discovery of an ancient library with more than 30,000 tablets. The Neo-Assyrian Empire's last great ruler was Ashurbanipal, founded in Mesopotamia in the 10th century BC. The empire became the world's biggest state until then, and dominated much of the Middle East before it collapsed in 609 BC. Ashurbanipal was not just a great military commander, but also an intellectual, which was rare for that era. He was literate, mastered multiple languages, and was a passionate collector of tablets and texts. He hired scribes to copy writings, sent others across the empire to find more, seized texts from defeated enemies as booty, and was not above using military threats to convince neighbors to send him writings from their countries. In 1849, British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard hit an archaeological jackpot when he discovered Ashurbanipal's library in Nineveh in today's Iraq. It contained more than 30,000 tablets and writing boards, many of them severely fragmented, but many still recoverable and legible. They included laws, diplomatic correspondence, financial and religious documents, plus texts on medicine, astronomy, and literature. One of the most significant finds in the library was the Epic of Gilgamesh, a masterpiece of ancient Babylonian poetry that dates to the 3rd millennium BC, and is considered to be humanity's oldest known literary work. The 20th century's greatest archaeological find Tutankhamun, who reigned circa 1333 to 1323 BC, is ancient Egypt's best known pharaoh, and the discovery of his tomb in 1922 was a major archaeological event. Relics from his tomb are among the most traveled artifacts in the world, and a 1970s exhibition, known as the Treasures of Tutankhamun Tour, was viewed by millions around the world, many of them having waited in line for hours. That he became so famous thousands of years after his death is ironic. Ancient Egyptians saw Tutankhamun, to the extent they even remembered that he had existed, as one of the least significant or memorable rulers. The discovery of his tomb occurred in 1922, after a search that had lasted for over a decade, Egyptologist Howard Carter found it in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. He sent a telegram to the chief financier of his archaeological expeditions, George Herbert, 5th Lord of Carnarvon, that urged him to hurry to Egypt to be at hand in person when the tomb was opened. After his patron arrived later that month, Howard Carter proceeded to carefully excavate the site, and on November 29, 1922, the tomb was opened. 
What was found inside revolutionized Egyptology? Gold, everywhere the glint of gold. After he wended his way through a tunnel, Howard Carter reached the main burial chamber, made a hole in a sealed door, and thrust a candle inside. After a pause, an eager Lord Carnarvon asked him, Can you see anything? He received the reply, Yes, wonderful things. As Carter described it later, as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist, strange animals, statues, and gold everywhere the glint of gold. The next day, the dramatic archaeological discovery was announced to the press, and Carter and Tutankhamun were catapulted to global fame. The burial chamber was dominated by four shrines that surrounded the pharaoh's granite sarcophagus. Within were three coffins, nestled one inside another. The outer two were made of gilded wood, while the innermost one was composed of about 250 pounds of solid gold. It contained the mummified body of Tutankhamun, owned with a funerary gold mask that weighed about 25 pounds. That death mask, with features simultaneously so familiar, and yet so exotic, became the best-known symbol of ancient Egypt. An archaeological find that kicked off Egyptomania around the world. Tutankhamun's sarcophagus and mummy were not the only things in the tomb, there were about 5,400 other items in there as well, they included a throne, wine jars, statues of various gods and of the king, and even two fetuses that subsequent DNA examination revealed to have been the stillborn offspring of Tutankhamun. It took Carter almost a decade before he managed to finish an archaeological catalogue of the tomb's contents. Astonishingly, the rich archaeological hall was what was left over, after ancient robbers had twice tunneled their way into the tomb. Both times the robbery was discovered and the tunnels were filled in. Carter's find triggered a wave of Egyptomania. Tutankhamun came to be known as King Tut, a name that was soon appropriated by businesses to brand various products. Ancient Egyptian references made their way into popular culture, and musical hits such as Old King Tut became all the rage. Even U.S. President Herbert Hoover caught the Tutankhamun bug, and named his pet dog King Tut. Although Tutankhamun is undoubtedly the most famous Egyptian pharaoh today, he was one of the least significant pharaohs back in ancient Egypt. An ancient Egyptian religious struggle between pharaohs and priests from roughly 2100 BC until the death of Cleopatra, in 30 BC, the Temple of the Gods at Karnak near Luxor, was ancient Egypt's religious center, a vast complex that covered hundreds of acres, it was dedicated to the worship of a pantheon of gods, chief among them the main deity Amun-Ra. Over time the priests of Karnak grew so powerful that they alarmed the pharaohs. One of them, Amenhotep III in an attempt to check them, appointed his own relatives to serve in the temple in order to guarantee the priests' loyalty, his successor Akhenaten had a more radical solution, he invented a new religion, and built a new temple complex to rival and replace Karnak, Akhenaten and his wife's sister, Egyptian pharaohs often kept it in the family, Nefertiti set up the world's first monotheistic religion, centered around the worship of the sun deity Aten. At first, Akhenaten added an extension to the Karnak temple, dedicated to his god Aten. When he encountered resistance from the established priesthood, however he turned to radical and wholesale reforms. The pharaoh began to dismantle his realm's traditional religious pantheon, and replaced its many gods with a single one, Aten. A religious tiff that roiled and bankrupted ancient Egypt. As happens often with recent converts, pharaoh Akhenaten became a zealot, and radically altered the way in which worship was to be conducted, until then and for centuries prior, priests were the conduit between Egyptians and their gods, and they acted as middlemen between mortals and deities. Akhenaten displaced the priesthood, and made himself and his sister-wife, Nefertiti, the main conduit through which divine blessings could flow. When the priests objected, the royal couple closed Karnak's temple, fired its priests, and seized its treasury. They then moved their entire court about 300 miles to the north, and built a new city and temple complex at Amarna, dedicated to Aten. Egypt whose religion and religious establishment were overturned, and displaced seemingly overnight, was plunged into spiritual and political turmoil, by the time Akhenaten finally died after a 17-year reign, Egypt was bankrupt. His sister-wife, Nefertiti, tried to continue on his path. She acted as regent for her stepson and nephew, Akhenaten's seven-year-old son, with another sister, King Tut. However she lost a political struggle at court, and power went instead to a grand vizier named A, who became the child pharaoh's chief advisor. An insignificant pharaoh, 
despite the archaeological riches in his tomb. The new ruler had been named Tutankhaten at birth, which means living image of Aten, after the sun god whom his father Akhenaten had ordered worshipped instead of a moon, when he ascended the throne as a child, he changed his name or had it changed for him by his advisors to Tutankhamun, which means living image of a moon. It heralded a rejection of his father's religious revolution, and a counter-revolution that restored Egypt's old gods and traditional ways of worship. The new authority figure's first step was to abandon Akhenaten's religious center at Amarna. Eventually they destroyed it. For all his fabled wealth, as implied by the archaeological treasures found in his tomb, Tutankhamun was a fairly insignificant pharaoh, not only had he been a child king for most of his reign, with real power wielded by his advisors, he was also physically disabled and sickly. A product of generations of incest, Tutankhamun's corpse exhibited many congenital defects caused by inbreeding. Among his ailments, he had a clubbed foot and needed a cane to walk. He also had a cleft palate, and scoliosis a deformation of the spine that caused it to deviate from its normal position. On top of that, he suffered frequent bouts of malaria which ultimately killed him. Many archaeological images and items in King Tut's tomb were not his. The death of Pharaoh Tutankhamun, after a ten-year reign was a gift to ancient Egypt's traditional priesthood, it afforded them the perfect opportunity to obliterate all traces of the deceased Pharaoh's hated father Akhenaten, and his sister wife Nefertiti, as well as the entire Amarna period. For example, Tutankhamun's throne depicts him and his sister wife Ankhesenamun together. However, recent examination has revealed that the depictions had been retouched, and that the images were altered and repurposed. The throne had originally depicted the despised Akhenaten and Nefertiti, figures whom the priests did not wish to see remembered or honored. So they performed the ancient Egyptian version of Photoshop, and repurposed the images to honor another couple similarly, Recent research has revealed that ancient Egypt's most famous archaeological artifact, Tutankhamun's burial mask, had not been made for him. Giveaways include conspicuously pierced earlobes for earrings, even though Egyptian males, especially male pharaohs, did not wear earrings beyond childhood. Additionally, the gold of the face turns out to be different from the gold of the rest of the mask, and evidence of later soldering is clearly visible. King Tut's contemporaries held him in low esteem. The face that stares at us from the golden mask of Pharaoh Tutankhamun is actually not the face of the famous King Tut, most likely, it is that of his father's sister wife, Nefertiti. It is now estimated that roughly four fifths of the archaeological finds discovered in Tutankhamun's tomb had originally belonged to Nefertiti. When King Tut died childless, the last member of a dynasty loathed by Egypt's priests, they simply raided the tombs of the hated Akhenaten and his equally hated wife, Nefertiti, and ransacked them for items to dump into Tutankhamun's tomb. Even the sarcophagus in which King Tut's mummified body was placed had been made for somebody else, Mason simply carved over and amended its original inscriptions, and repurposed them for Tutankhamun. It was a demonstration that Egypt was fully restored to its official state religion, centered on the worship of Amun, that the Temple of Karnak was back in business, and that the traditional priesthood had regained its power. As to King Tut, the relative disdain in which contemporaries held him inadvertently protected his tomb far, more than the tombs of more respected and honored pharaohs. One of history's greatest archaeological finds owes a debt of gratitude to the low regard in which ancient Egyptians held King Tut. Ancient Egyptian royal architects were constantly on the lookout for spots in the Valley of the Kings that were suitable for new tombs, when architects of later eras excavated new burial tombs, for other pharaohs higher up the hill, where Tutankhamun was buried, they simply dumped the debris and detritus downhill. Fortuitously the debris piled up at the entrance to Tutankhamun's tomb, and eventually covered it completely. The teenaged pharaoh was apparently so little regarded that nobody bothered to clear the rubble from in front of his tomb, and it simply sat there until his burial site was forgotten. In due course and over the centuries, the tombs of the more important and respected pharaohs were looted by robbers, that of Tutankhamun, forgotten and its entrance concealed by mounds of rubble, remained hidden until it was rediscovered intact millennia later in one of the greatest archaeological finds ever. Sheer luck made Tutankhamun world famous thousands of years later, despite the dearth of his accomplishments, while far more accomplished pharaohs were relegated to relative oblivion. As one Egyptologist put it, the pharaoh who in life was one of the least esteemed of Egypt's pharaohs has become in death the most renowned. An archaeological treasure trove in a South African cave
in 2013 an archaeological treasure trove of fossilized hominid skeletons, was discovered in a South African cave, located roughly 30 miles from Johannesburg, about 1,550 skeletal pieces from 15 individuals were unearthed. The fossils combined anatomical features from an early hominid species known as Australopithecus, such as a small brain case volume, with the skull shape of the more advanced early Homo. That combination of features led scientists to assume that the fossils came from an early hominid species about 2 million years old. It was a reasonable ballpark initial guess, since hominids with those types of anatomical features were known to have existed around that time, however by 2017, the fossils had been more accurately dated to between 335,000 to 236,000 years ago. They were thus not part of the lineage that led to modern humans, but an extinct and more primitive hominid that coexisted with more modern homos. The new species was dubbed Homo naledi. As seen below, the excitement about the newly discovered species was not limited to the sheer number of bones. A discovery that changed assumptions about primitive hominids' intelligence. The condition and placement of the Homo naledi bones overturned long-held assumptions about the behavior of primitive hominids, the bones lacked the kinds of null marks by a wild beast that would indicate that they had been dragged into the cave by carnivores. They were also located deep in a shaft where they were unlikely to have ended up by accident. As such, it became clear that the bones had been deliberately placed in the cave by other Homo naledi individuals. In other words, they were buried. It was not the earliest known burial on archaeological find of 28 skeletons, roughly 430,000 years old, had been discovered years earlier in a Spanish cave. However, the Spanish skeletons came from a big-brained Homo species that looked and behaved much like modern humans. Homo naledi, on the other hand, had a brain half the size of ours and could not have been mistaken for a modern human. However, its burial practices demonstrated that its individuals understood mortality and the concept of something after death. That squashed the notion, widespread until then, that such notions and behavior required big brains and forced a re-examination of early hominids' culture and intelligence. Did Homer's Troy ever actually exist? The Iliad Homer's epic poem is set in and around Troy and recounts the final year of the Trojan War, which was fought sometime in the 13th century BC. As told by Homer, the city of Troy was subjected to a 10-year siege by a Greek coalition led by Mycenae's high king Agamemnon. Their goal was to recover Helen, the wife of Sparta's king and Agamemnon's brother Menelaus, after she had been seduced by Paris the son of Troy's King Priam. The epic poem features plenty of rollicking adventures, a surfeit of graphic and gory combat, and numerous plot twists and turns from humans and gods. In the end, the city falls when the wily Odysseus tricks the Trojans and gets them to let in a huge wooden horse, hollow on the inside and packed with Greek warriors. As a story, the Iliad was awesome. As history, however, Troy and the Trojan War were dismissed for centuries as pure myth. Then came an archaeological find that overturned those assumptions. The man who discovered not one Troy, but nine. German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann was convinced that there was actual truth in the Iliad, and set out to prove it. From 1870 to 1890, he conducted archaeological excavations at a site in the northwest of the Anatolian Peninsula, the Asian part of modern Turkey. He made some initial finds of gold and silver that convinced him that he had found Homer's Troy. As it turned out, Schliemann had excavated the right city, but the wrong period, his initial finds dated from about 1,000 years before the Trojan War. The site of Schliemann's archaeological digs actually held the remains of nine different Troys that were built one atop another. Excavations continued after Schliemann's death in 1890, and today his finds are labeled Troy A through 9. Troy Vi is the likeliest candidate for Homer's Troy. The discovery of Troy was a magnificent archaeological accomplishment, but it was not the only one by Heinrich Schliemann who, as seen below, might have been the most fortunate archaeologist to have ever lived. The man who twice captured archaeological lightning in a bottle After he excavated and proved the existence of ancient Troy, Heinrich Schliemann captured archaeological lightning in a bottle once more, this time it was in mainland Greece, where he found what came to be known as the Mask of Agamemnon, the high king of Mycenae who led the Greeks against Troy. It happened in 1876, when Schliemann conducted excavations in the royal cemetery near the Lion Gate, the entrance to the citadel of Mycenae in southern Greece. In one of the graves, he found a funeral mask covered in gold, 
which he attributed to the legendary king from the Iliad, as Schliemann put it in a telegram that announced the discovery, I have gazed upon the face of Agamemnon, however, as with his finds in Troy, Schliemann got the broad outlines right, but jumped the gun when it came to the details. Later research proved that the mask did, indeed, belong to a Mycenaean king. However it was a king who had died circa 1580-1550 BC, two and a half to three centuries before the events of the Trojan War. The name stuck however and the artifact is still commonly referred to as the Mask of Agamemnon.